this is a perfectly normal thing to be doing on a Friday night, right? Right? Hello, Internet. My name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Axe. I'm back on the Fire 2 boiler project, and I built the core last time, and now I want to see if I can pressure test it in isolation before I build it into the final boiler, because it's going to be a lot easier to fix any leaks right now. So let's go. Here's where I am right now on this model boiler project. You can see I built the core, the fire tubes in the two plates, and this assembly slides into the shell. Now before I solder it in there, I want to try and figure out if the joints are any good on those tubes, because as I learned previously, it's nearly impossible to fix them once the boiler is fully assembled. Real quick, since I know not everybody watches every video, hydrostatic testing is how you test a pressure vessel safely. You pump it full of water and pressurize the water because water doesn't compress and store energy like a gas does, so it won't explode if the structure fails. Before I do the actual hydrostatic pressure test, I want to actually test my pump because one thing I noticed when pressure testing my last boiler is that this pump actually has some bleed down in it. So I made a blanking plug for the end of the hose here and I'm going to just pressurize the hose and the pump itself. With that sealed up, I pumped it up to 120 PSI and then closed the valve and just watch it and see. In principle, the pump should be able to hold 120 PSI essentially indefinitely, but it does in fact bleed down very slowly. I tried snugging up some of the connections, but it does indeed bleed down a little bit. And it's not any of my fittings or adapters here. There's no moisture on that anywhere. so might be the o-rings inside the pump who knows but it's good to just kind of calibrate what the bleed down of your pump is and then if i get this amount of bleed down on my boiler then i know it's probably not the boiler's fault here's the boiler core that you saw me make in the previous video in this series so the question is can i pressure test this in isolation now my first idea was if there's some way to enclose the core much like the shell would in a way that's easy to do, then that would be worth doing. Now, I tried to like buy a piece of steel pipe or something that had the exact right ID to go around this core, and I couldn't find anything even close that was gonna work. I could, of course, use the shell itself, but that's very expensive, and I'd have to make a new custom piece just to fit the core in the way that I need to to seal the ends. So I needed something more like temporary and quick and dirty. So the next idea I had was you can buy this high pressure silicone tubing. It's used for plumbing turbochargers in cars. And uh, it's actually quite good stuff if you get the good stuff. Be careful because there's a lot of knockoffs of this stuff. The good stuff is rated to 250 PSI. The cheap stuff is as low as 40, so make sure you're getting the good stuff. But my thought was the four inch diameter might be perfect to wrap around my core. And it comes with these nice fully sealing hose clamps. And this stuff comes in four inch diameter, which I knew was gonna be a little too big for the core, as you can see, but my hope was that maybe it would squish down once I put the clamp on it. You know, this kit with the hose and the clamps was $15, so for that I figured, what the heck, I'll give it a try, because if it works, it's a super easy solution to my problem of pressure testing this core. So I tightened the clamp down, but as you can see, when I got close to the end here, it was clear that this was not going to work. The tube is buckling there, and it's just not going to fit. So it was uh, worth a try, but uh, on to plan B. The next idea actually came from one of my patrons, Tanda Madison. You should follow her on Instagram because she's awesome. She suggested pressure testing this thing inside out. Just cap the ends and pressure test the inside because the ends are much easier to cap. So my first thought was, okay, let's use an O-ring for this. There's a problem with that though, and that's these stud holes. You can see they're very close to the tops of the flanges by design to try and keep them out of the pressure vessel, but that's going to make them difficult to seal with an O-ring. An O-ring needs a land, which would be probably trepanned into the end plate, but then it has to seat down and it's going to be half covering those bolt holes, or I have to try and fit some kind of O-ring inside the rim. And I also couldn't find an O-ring the right size, so it just really wasn't going to work. So I think I need to use some kind of flat gasket instead. First step is to make some end plates. So I have this previously gigantic, then large, then medium, now soon to be small slug of aluminum that you may recognize from many recent projects. And I'm gonna make a couple of four inch diameter end plates to go on the ends of this core. So I need to turn down a fair bit of this diameter. And as I've recently learned, a good way to do this on a small lathe is to take a very deep depth of cut, but a very, very fine feed, like much finer than your lowest power feed settings. I'm feeding by hand and basically just keeping light pressure on the tool. 
and it makes these very wide, very thin chips that are easy to control. And uh, that way you don't get giant bird's nests that you're constantly having to fish out of the tool. But your feed rate has to be just perfect or it does pile up on itself and you have to clear it out. While I'm making chips here, let me explain one possible catch with pressure testing the core inside out. The fire tubes in a fire tube boiler are specifically thinner than they might otherwise need to be. And that's because the pressure is on the outsides of the tubes. And you can get away with that because of course the outside of a tube is much stronger than the inside. Think about like an eggshell, mom can sit on the egg, doesn't break because it's very strong, but the chick can still break out from the inside because from the inside an arch shape is very weak or like an arched bridge, for example. They're very strong from above, very weak from below. So boilers tend to take advantage of that because you want the tubes to be as thin as possible. The thinner the tubes are, the more efficient they are at transferring the heat into the water, and they lose less heat through conduction up out the chimney. So just to be sure, I looked up the pressure rating of half-inch type L copper water pipe, which is what my tubes are, and even annealed, they're rated at 600 PSI working pressure, and the burst pressure is 4,200 PSI. So no risk of pressure testing them from the inside with 120 PSI. With that diameter turned, I'll face the front side, as is tradition. You'll note that I'm not going to be facing both sides of each disc here. I just need one side to be machined because it's going to be a gasket sealing surface. After a couple of passes, I almost got it cleaned up. And I actually left it that way for a while thinking, oh, it's just a fixture, that'll be fine. And later I remembered, no, that's a gasket sealing surface. It has to be perfect. And I went back and fixed it. No matter how you turn aluminum, you still end up with a giant pile of chips at the end. And the only one happy about this is Swarfy the duck. <laughs> got the parting blade now and I'm just going to make two grooves where I want to separate the two discs for my end caps. I'll have no hope of parting all the way through this giant chunk so I'm just going to make grooves for the bandsaw and that'll help guide the blade and tell me where to cut. Woodworker precision is sufficient here. I just need to roughly divide this into two plates. While I have it set up on the lathe here, I'm going to drill a hole all the way through. There's already a partial hole there from some previous fixture made with this chunk. Even though the lower disc doesn't actually need a hole in it, I'm going to end up with a hole in it that I'll have to plug later. But there's really no choice here because I need a hole to set this up on the bandsaw, as you'll see. Nice side effect of those starting grooves with the parting blade is it gives me a chance to come in and deburr both edges of both the discs. So after the bandsaw goes through, there will already be nice chamfered edges all the way around. Over to the bandsaw now, and this is a setup that I've shown before for cutting thin large diameter pieces with small machine tools, and that's that you bolt an angle plate into the vise on your bandsaw, and then I bolt this stock all the way through with some threaded rod, and then I just got to line up my starting grooves there with the blade, so I just tappy tap tap the angle plate into position. And depending on how much precision you need here, you can either indicate in that angle plate to get it square to the blade, or you can just clamp it in the bandsaw vise, and that'll square it up approximately pretty well. With it lined up, I bolt the angle plate down using the vise slot there on the back of the bandsaw. And then I start my cut. I'm using WD-40 there to keep the blade from plugging up on this aluminum. And away we go. Now, obviously you can't cut this all the way through because you're gonna cut through the threaded rod. So what I do is I let the saw run until it looks like it's close to the threaded rod and then I'll stop it and rotate the part. You can see that there would be no way to clamp this part in that vise. It's both too large a diameter for this vise and the stock itself is not long enough for the vise to get a proper grip on it. 
So with the first cut done, I loosen the bolt, rotate it around to a new area, run the saw down again, and you can just keep rotating and cutting as many times as you need. Typically three or four spots is enough to get it to where you're basically right down to the bolt all the way around. Then normally at this point I take it over to the hacksaw to finish it up, but actually this time I realized I could put some small clamps on the extra stock there and just finish the cut this way. There was just enough room. You've got to be careful though and not let the saw drop because it's going to land on the angle plate and the clamps. So I've got my hand on the carriage there, but be extra careful because the saw not going all the way down means it's not hitting the automatic shutoff, so that blade's going to keep running. I can't say I recommend doing this with your bandsaw, but in a pinch. There wasn't room for the clamps on the second chunk, so over to the hacksaw, and that was easier than I expected. I guess you could say I cut it a little close on that center bolt. That second disc has bandsaw cuts on both sides now, so I gotta face one side for the gasket. So I dialed it in here on the forejaw, and I'm gonna face off this side as is tradition. I like facing bandsaw cuts in aluminum because the uneven surface breaks the chip for you, so you get real nice chips coming off of that. Now recall that I don't actually want a hole in the bottom plate, so I'm going to enlarge it to the tapping drill size for 5 16th 32, which is a size of boiler bushing plug that I have that I normally use for pressure testing. So it'll do double duty here for that. So bring in the 5 16th 32 tap. If that sounds like a weird size to you, you must not be a model engineer. It's actually a very common size in model engineering, but not a very common size anywhere else. Model engineers, as it turns out, use a whole lot of weird threads that nobody else does. After you've worked on boilers for a while, you end up with handfuls of blanking plugs in a couple of common sizes, including 5 16 32 and quarter 40. Those are the two that I have lots of. The top plate now needs an additional hole for the fill valve, and so I'm going to do that on the drill press because it's off-center. Luckily, my drill press vise opens up nice and big, so I should have no trouble... Uh. Just, just, I need another, like, sixteenth of a, uh, imperial fist shake of frustration. As I was saying, I will, of course, be using a strap clamp to attach this directly to the table, as is standard for a part this size. You wouldn't expect a vise to hold something like that. I'm drilling and tapping this other hole to match the adapter that I happen to have already made for my pressure testing pump that I use for all of my boiler builds. It happens to be quarter 40. There's those model engineer threads again. So I just tap this by hand. No points for straightness here. Quick deburr, and those plates are done. So the top needs a fill hole and a vent hole. That's why there's two. Now for a gasket, I'm going to use this stuff. This is a Felpro paper gasket material. And paper gaskets, if you're not aware, are extremely high tech these days. Most of the gaskets in your car are probably paper. I've run this stuff up to 60 PSI and my steam engine's no problem, so I think it'll suffice for this test. Plus I have a lot of it on hand, so I'm going to try it. Let's mock this up and see if maybe it's going to work. So everything is a little bit larger than the end caps on the core, so that seems like that should work. Now those stud holes I mentioned need to be plugged. They are the reason I couldn't use an o-ring. So I got some screws here and I'll cut some Loctite 545 on there. Make sure to spill that all over the bench. That's part of how it works. I think this will be sufficient to plug those holes. Loctite 545 is pretty amazing stuff. I've seen it fix leaks much worse than this. And I plug the bottom plate and I also need to plug the boiler bushings in the top of the core. Luckily they're threaded all the way through, so it's easy enough to just plug them from behind. Again, using standard 5 16 32 boiler blanking plugs that I have by the handful, because I keep making new ones, because I keep needing more of them. So that looks like that's going to work. Luckily I had easy access to them from the back. Okay, so I'll clean up the surface here and apply the gasket, and let's see if this is going to work. So this is the bottom plate here. These gaskets apparently work better if you cut an opening in the center of them and not leave them solid like I did there, but I'll try this and see if it works. So I got out all the small clamps that I have, which is not that many. I've got just enough for three at each end, so I will try that. Hopefully that'll be enough to clamp these all the way around. It's kind of a motley crew here of clamps. Oh, 
Over on the top now, same thing, set up the gasket, put on the plate, and then I realized that this gasket does have to be cut out because of course I need to be able to fill through the fill hole and vent through the vent hole. So I opened up that gasket and let's try that again. And more Loctite on the adapter here for my hydrostatic test pump. Thread that into the side hole. Get that nice and snug. And then on goes the hose and let's fill this thing with water. So I'm pumping the boiler full now. The vent hole is open so the air can escape. And I just pump it full of water until the water comes out the top there. The goal is to get all the air out of the boiler, of course. The whole point of hydrostatic testing is that there's no gas to compress inside the boiler. We're only pressurizing water, so if anything fails, it's safe, it won't explode. So it's watertight, that's good. Now I start building pressure, and I'm about 5 or 10 psi up here, and the gasket started leaking all over, as you can see there. I tried tightening up my clamps. I gave it another shot, but yeah, same deal. Right around 10 PSI, that gasket fails. I think the clamping of my end plates is not sufficient. Three points of clamping on a four inch diameter is really not enough for a pressure seal. So I thought I might just leave it here and think, well, the tube joints look good, they're probably fine. But then I happen to be on Amazon and I noticed that crappy C clamps are cheap like borscht. For less than a nice dinner for one, I can buy a dozen of these things, so I did. So I figured, what the heck. I made new gaskets, I'll give this one more shot before I give up on the idea. So with 12 of them, I've now got six points of clamping on each end, which is about as many as I can physically fit here. So let's see if this is any better. I snugged up the clamps as evenly as I could all the way around, and then I attached the hose once again. Snug that down real good, fill the boiler with water once again, and then put the final blanking plug back in, and let's see if this thing will build some pressure. So right off the bat, it cruised past the point where it was leaking before. I got all the way up to about 40 PSI here. It was really actually building pressure quite good. No sign of any leaks anywhere, so that's encouraging. Around 40 PSI, the gasket started to fail again. So I went around and snugged up all my clamps. I was trying to get them as tight as I dare, but if I go too tight, I'm just gonna shear the paper gasket with the copper edge there. So I tightened it up some more, and that actually bought me about another 20 PSI. I was able to get up to 60 PSI now before the gasket started to seep again. But that's actually very good. Like that's high enough that I can inspect my tube joints. For example, there was one tube joint in particular here on the top underneath. You can see that I don't have a strong fillet there around that tube. There is a ring of solder around it, but not a large fillet. So I was slightly concerned about that one. Right now I'm pumping it up to about 100 PSI. So of course the gasket is seeping a lot, but if any of these tube joints were gonna leak, they would also be seeping right now in addition to the gasket failing. So I can pump it up to above 60 PSI and it bleeds down to 60 where the gasket starts holding again, but I can use that time to inspect the other joints. The ideal would have been to get the whole setup up to 120 PSI, the final hydrostatic test pressure, but this setup does hold 60 very, very well, as you can see here. And the goal with any hydrostatic pressure test is to be able to hold a test pressure for a long period of time with no bleed down. So this at least tells me that my tubes are good to 60 PSI, which is the working pressure, if not the final test pressure. And that gives me the confidence to finish assembling this boiler. I think I can say that these tube joints are probably good. Of course, I can't say for sure that tube joints that are good at 60 are going to be good to 120, but I think this exercise was definitely worth doing, and I suppose I could try some different gasket material or try to get more clamps in there or make more robust end plates or various other things, but at this point, I've put quite a bit of time into this, and I think I've developed the confidence that I needed to go ahead and finish soldering up this boiler. So I hope you enjoyed this little exercise. Thank you very much for watching. If you can swing it, throw me a little love there on Patreon. That's really what keeps this content going. And I will see you next time.